okay uh, value added tax you are familiar with this concepts uh, before taking the business taxation course because uh, we have to pay vat irrespective of our income level because uh, vat is not dependent on income rather vat is dependent on the expenditure so if we engage in making expenditure on which vat is applicable uh, probably all of us have experienced uh, paying vat so many of us try to avoid uh, paying vat by changing our transaction pattern or by avoiding the recording of transaction so uh, you will get such kind of experience also when you will go for transaction uh, when you will go for making transactions in shopping or in other uh, shops uh, we all have tendency to avoid the recording so that uh, the vat it can be skipped vat payment can be skipped so before going for those kind of discussion furthermore let me uh, tell you the very basic concept of vat uh, the tax which is paid on the value addition and another thing is that what i like to add with your very uh, very introduction class can you recall the that how much vat contributed in our ta total tax revenue we talked about income tax we talked about customs duty we talked about value added tax is there any idea that how much of our 100 taka tax revenue in this pie how much uh, of this 100 taka tax revenue comes from value added tax sir 30 uh, 37% yeah, around that percentage, 35 to 36 or 37 percent is percentages. Uh, if you look at the, thank you for your answer. Uh, if you look at the historical composition of our total tax revenue, you will see this range value added tax contribution to our total tax revenue ranges from 35 to 36, these percentages on an average. So we can easily understand how significant that is in its contribution to our total tax revenue and in term which also contributes to our uh, total government revenue and in general it contributes us to help the formation of our country to continue the regular activities of government these things okay so the thing is that uh, that is kind of direct or indirect tax? Indirect tax. That is a kind of indirect tax. Very common question to you. And can anyone explain in detail why we tell that as an indirect tax in terms of tax terms or in terms of economic terms? We know that that can be transferable. Uh, that's why it is known as indirect tax. I mean, the burden can be transferable. But there are two terms. I don't know uh, whether you are familiar with those terms from your uh, microeconomics text or any other text, uh, any other text from your earlier education level. Okay. Uh, have you heard about impact and incidence of tax? Yes, sir. Uh, from in macro, where? In macroeconomics. Macro? Yes, no, sir. Microeconomics. Micro? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. Uh, what is impact? So how much the say, uh, the buyer or the seller has to uh, bear the impact of the tax? It is the immediate, immediate transfer, right? Immediate burden. Immediate, immediate burden. burden taken by the buyer or the seller taken by the buyer okay then uh, what is incidence the burden which is ultimately born yes sir exactly exactly right? yes, 
ultimately bound by the loop. Okay, okay. So in case of value added tax, in case of value added tax, if you look at um, the entities which are involved in the business cycle, so all parties except the customer uh, can transfer the value added tax they paid to their seller to the buyer to whom they are selling goods they can transfer i mean if you uh, if you talk about wholesaler wholesaler pays vat when they purchase goods from importer what importer can do in turn importer when importer will sell the goods to the retailer he will collect the price including vat from retailer yes sir and the amount of vat he collected from the retailer will compensate a portion of the vat he paid to the importer the good is the good is transferred from importer to wholesaler wholesaler to retailer so in each in each stage there is a valuation there is a uh, vat payable so when wholesaler pays vat to the importer ultimately the vat is payable to the government but this entity is individually responsible for collecting vat uh, on behalf of the authority so they will ultimately transfer the amount they collected in the name of vat to the government account but the thing is that uh, when the wholesaler has bought goods from importer wholesaler has paid input vat for the goods he has taken as input he has paid input vat the wholesaler and when wholesaler will sell the goods after having some value addition to the retailer what will happen he will collect vat from retailer and that vat will be known as input vat to the retailer but for wholesaler that vat will be known as output vat so which one is a bigger number for wholesaler input vat or output vat so is that output vat output vat will be a bigger number because there has been some value addition by the wholesaler so the value has become increased so if you apply the percentage the output vat is expected to be higher than the input vat so there is a difference yes sir there is a difference so you see let's say uh, input vat paid by the wholesaler is say for example uh, 10 taka and he has collected for example 14 taka so how much wholesaler is now liable to pay to the government the wholesaler 4 taka 4 taka yes uh, who will pay this 10 taka importer will pay okay because importer has collected it from the wholesaler importer has collected this amount from whom from the wholesaler and wholesaler has collected how much 14 taka from the retailer and how much is uh, liability to the wholesaler to be paid to the government the 4 taka okay i if i i don't think, think about other parties how much government is taking in total 10 taka from importer uh then 4 taka from the wholesaler but the thing is that uh ultimately if the retailer uh, retailer is not the final person ultimately total vat will be paid by the total vat will be paid by the customer or ultimate uh which is more appropriate the word is consumer the consumer ultimately bears the whole burden the thing is that importer will pay this amount to the 
government or wholesaler will pay this amount to the government, they will collect this amount from the subsequent parties. So ultimate the incidents will be borne by whom? Incidents will be borne by the consumer. Okay. Sir, last at two hours to bowl, sir. Incidents keep a whole when a consumer can have one color pura puri. Because uh, this tax, value added tax, which is indirect tax, is to be finally borne by the person who consumes the goods or services. It is not the person who are involved in the uh, in the process which uh, in which consumer is not there. I mean, there is wholesaler, there is importer, there is distributor, there is retailer. There, uh, these parties will not bear this. Who will bear this ultimately? Consumer. How consumer is bearing this all? Sir, is it because, by value adding? Sorry? Value adding? In the process, the value is added, then they have added the value. But yes, the thing is that uh, I have showed to you that 10 taka has been paid by importer. Four taka has been paid by wholesaler. Can you recall? Yes. So sir. what what they will do? They will collect this amount from whom? From the consumer. How? By adding this price to the. By adding this VAT to their price. Yes, sir. Okay. So I will show you a detailed calculation later. This is just kind of idea to understand the impact and incidence. Okay. So, so now I got it. Thank you, sir. Welcome. The impact and incidence of value added tax is totally borne by the uh, totally borne by the consumer, and it is uh, the it can be transferable. It is kind of indirect tax. And another thing, what I like to highlight is that uh, this value added tax is directly proportional to the expenditure. It is not proportional to the income. But the tax, what we have learned from previous classes, kind of uh, individual assessment, company assessment, uh, what is the base variable there? The income tax is proportional to income. income tax is proportional to income or anything else proportional to income proportional to income a value added tax is proportional to what expenditure value added tax is proportional to the expenditure if you do expenditure and that expenditure involves vat we will have to incur vat if we do not make expenditure in that case, we can avoid, uh, we do not have to pay the VAT, okay? So you probably have heard about the very recently enacted VAT Act, which is known as uh, value added tax and uh, value added tax and supplementary duty act 2012. Have you heard about it? value added tax and supplementary duty act 2012 you have heard about it you have much heard about it because of the movement named novet can you recall that movement People Is, was devastated. that on, huh? Was that on university edu uh, private university education back in two thousand? Yeah, uh, yeah. I was referring that, uh, but at the same time, you also uh, that was significant, and in last recent years also, you have experienced that the businessmen are opposing to the implementation of this act. They don't want to get 
it implemented as it was introduced. So there has been a series of changes in this act. For that reason, this act is no longer in its original form. The implementation has started, but there was some uh, issues which are introduced in this act to simplify the VAT, to simplify the VAT process. But because of the opposition made by the business people, made by other parties, government could not implement it as it is uh, expected or designed originally. So, <clears throat> in addition to this, uh, we have to recognize this. Uh, can you recall that uh, we have income tax ordinances still now 1984? Can you recall we have income tax ordinance 1984? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. In relation to that act, there is income tax rules 1984. Yes, sir. Okay. What is the purpose of the rule? The purpose of the rule is to implement the act. Okay. Yes, sir. To implement any ordinance or to implement any act, there is a rules required. So to implement this value added tax and supplementary duty act, the value added tax and supplementary duty rules 2016 is now effective. Value added tax and supplementary duty rules 2016. Okay. So the thing is that uh, if we now ask for reference which VAT Act is now ongoing or which VAT rules are now ongoing, the answer is this acts and these rules. Okay, so however you can look at the original document for these acts and these rules in the NVR website. If you go to the acts and look at the VAT acts, you will see there is a value added tax and supplementary duty act 2012. Okay, so before that, which was applicable in our country. 1991 okay you probably have heard about that this on in 1991 that was introduced in bangladesh can you recall this is a kind of yes, uh, very common gk question this is a kind of very common gk question there was a there was a date on which date that was introduced in bangladesh in 1991 on which date the july act okay Thank you. So let's continue our discussion. The thing is that if anyone asks what is the VAT percentage, the percentage is always 15% except the exception. But the thing is that in general, the VAT rate is 15%. But the problem is that uh, in this act 2012, the uniform VAT rate was proposed, but businessmen were, were concerned that it would increase the cost of the consumers. So they wanted to reduce the rate and they also wanted to uh, make differentiation in the rates for different aspects. So the VAT rate is no longer uniform 15%. You will see different rates applicable in different areas, different segments, different business, different products, different businesses, different services. In different fields, you will see the VAT rate is different. And sometimes you will see 
the VAT rate has not been expressed in percentage, rather the VAT rate has been expressed in terms of some quantity of goods. For example, uh, in newspaper, in newspaper, what is the basic raw material for newspaper owners? So paper. Paper is the basic raw material for a newspaper owner. So on that paper, which is used for a newspaper, the VAT is charged based on the quantity expressed in a ton. Expressed in ton. So it is a kind of uh, unique that uh, VAT has been expressed not in terms of value addition, not in terms of value, not in terms of final price, but in terms of some uh, quantity. So the thing is that uh, it looks like I can't recall the right exact amount that how much is uh, how much is VAT to be payable on that part ton. So I just have got it from your uh, text 514 page, 14 page. On the newsprint paper, the VAT is uh, 1600 taka per ton. 1600 taka per ton. Okay. Now, another uh, example on which the VAT is not based on value addition or base is not value addition, rather uh, it is based on the quantity or based on some grades. So that example, another one, another example is, for example, I should say uh, bricks bricks of different grades. You know that uh, for bricks, there are different grade. Are you familiar with it? Bricks, there are several grades. Any idea how many grades yes, are sir. available in our country for bricks? One, two, 20, 30, 15, more than 100. Is there anyone build, a building owner or who has involved in construction of his house? No one. Okay. Uh, if you go for purchasing bricks uh, to the brick uh, seller, they will tell you uh, more than uh, or close to 10 type of grades or more than 10 grades or very specifically or very narrowly you will see close to three type of grade. So in tax or VAT uh, environment, they have recognized that there should be three type of grade or three grades. So for three grades, VAT rate are different 450, uh, 450, 500, 700. I'm not sure that this uh, amount has been, this amount is based on some uh, ton. Uh, probably it is based on ton, but I'm not sure. But the rates are different for, it has been based on what? Based on the great, different gates of bricks. So these are some kind of unique uh, kind of imposing uh, imposition of VAT, uh, which is different from the conventional imposition of VAT based on the value addition or based on the uh, monetary value, rather based on some quantity. Okay. So. If we do not know what is the rate applicable, 
by default, we need to know the VAT rate is 15%. Okay. Uh, can anyone tell me what the, is the VAT rate you have experienced when you go for uh, having your lunch or evening snacks at some restaurants where VAT is applicable? How much VAT they charge from you? Have you seen the invoice? Yes, sir. How much VAT they charge? So fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Okay. Now, I believe that you, uh, many of you, have experience of having uh, shopping from super shop. How much VAT they charge from you? Sir, fifteen percent. Fifteen percent. Sure. Sir, it varies. Okay. Uh, fr from which percentage to which percentage it varies? Uh, sir, 10 to 30 percent. 10 to 30 percent. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. But I have not experienced such higher rate in case of uh, super shop shopping. Uh, I can't recall the exact percentage, but uh, as my knowledge goes, uh, the charge, uh, I mean, their products are some kind of, uh, what should I say? Uh, if you buy the same package of goods, uh, which are kind of packaged goods, I mean, if I, uh, if I like to give you an example, uh, Say, if you want to buy a packaged good, uh, not in terms of uh, op open. So same packaged good, say one packet of something, one packet of something from open market or same one packet of goods, same brand. I'm not mentioning any brand right now or any product, say one packet of rice. Okay, you can think of one kind of, one packet of aromatic rice or one kg of aromatic rice, which is packaged of a particular brand. If you go for buying this uh, from the open market and or from the super shop, in super shop, uh, you have to pay 4.5% extra, 4.5% uh, extra. Uh, I believe that that percentage is close to 4.5 to 5%. You can uh, verify it when you will go for buying or when you'll go for comparing this, whether it is 5% or 4.5% or different from this. So it is not on all goods. So based on the packaged goods, this rate is applicable. So sometimes you'll see uh, for some goods, the price is uh, cheaper in super shop compared to open market. So on those goods, the VAT is not applicable. Uh, all super, uh, all uh, goods are not uh, under the VAT net. So other than the uniform VAT rate, 15%, if you, go to, uh, if you go through the VAT and Supplementary Duty Act, you will see several uh, VAT rates. So that is dependent on the uh, base on which the VAT is implemented or VAT is calculated. So one, uh, other than the 15%, which percentages you are expected to see uh, as a VAT? So these other percentages are, uh, I just have mentioned uh, one percentage uh, that is 4.5%. Uh, so other than the 15%, 
you are expected to see you are expected to see other uh, vat rates which are uh, 2%, 2.4%, uh, 4.5%, 5% and percent 10%. So how many rates I have mentioned other than 15%? Six. Six. So usually when VAT is uh, imp imposed on the full value, that rate is 15%. But when the full value is not clear, VAT is imposed based on some estimated value addition. In that case, you are expected to see this kind of uh, percentages say 2%, 2 2.4%, 4.5%, 5%, 7.5%, 10%. Okay. I just have given an example of uh, the buying from super shop. Okay. Is it very clearly distinguishable how much value addition is done by the super shop in their goods they are selling is it very easily distinguishable no sir have you got my question no, sir, easy to distinguish for in that case uh, the 15 percent has not been applied there so that is the reason why you see the 4.5 percent there okay so you will experience different percentages and you will, what you will do immediately, you will try to understand that what is the reason of imposing this different rate other than 15%. You will immediately recognize that uh, the percentages on which you are paying in that particular transaction, uh, value addition is not clearly identifiable. That's why this different rate has been applied. Okay, so let's continue. Uh, the thing is that <clears throat> uh, when a good is produced, there are different parties involved. But if we summarize those parties in the name of producer, we still have to take help from other parties to take the goods from the production stage to the consumption stage. So there is a whole supply chain process involved. So in that case, the expected parties who are commonly involved are known as wholesaler here, then retailer, before retailer there can be some other uh, slab like uh, the distributor. Okay, we are just uh, simplifying in this way. Final consumer. So if producer is uh, dependent on some natural, uh, natural, what should I say, naturally produced or locally produced thing, in that case, the supply chain starts from where? Producer? If production of that product is dependent on some locally produced natural goods, Production starts from producer. Or yes, sir. Some other parties before in the backward side. But if we think of that, there are some goods which is required by the producer, which is not locally available. In that case, producer has to depend on some imported things. 
okay so in each stage if you try to understand this cycle in each stage there should be some value addition except the final consumer does the consumer add any value no sir okay but other than the consumer all parties try to add some value so which things are considered as value is it always uh, adding some goods which is directly uh, identifiable from the product for example if you look at uh, the product uh, in this stage from importer to producer you can immediately recognize there has been a significant transformation of the product from the raw material but if you look at the same product from the producer to wholesaler has there been any significant transformation no sir it's just a kind of uh, transferring goods from one place to another place this kind of or from big a uh, seller to small seller these things or manufacturer to wholesaler but how we are telling that uh, each stage here each stage here is still there are some value addition so okay. it comes of interest of price there is a value addition here okay so you see that uh, <clears throat> here uh, processing is done here when producer transfer goods to the wholesaler there has been some lever involved there has been some lever involved to transfer the ship the goods from producer to wholesaler yes sir or it is free of cost there has been some there should be some transportation cost there should be some other overhead if you uh, <clears throat> if the wholesaler maintains the goods in a warehouse there should be some overhead cost or there should be no cost for housing the goods what do you think there should be some overhead costs okay these things are expected to expected to repeat here also when wholesaler does uh, when the goods are in the hand of retailer a retailer has some people who are helping him to sell the goods and uh, he has some transportation cost to take the goods from a uh, wholesaler shop to his shop and there has been some overhead cost for uh, storing those goods there should be yes sir okay so these things are example of value this example uh, this part sir uh, this components are example of value and for this cost for this cost in addition to this cost coverage the parties also want to have some profit okay so these are some example of value addition so let me give you an example that how uh the vat is collected and how vat is paid and who are responsible for paying vat and how the goods are transferred from each stage to each stage which is very uh mostly familiar with all of you say if good if the material comes from some imported component then producer 
take the component and produce the product, then he transfer to the goods to the wholesaler, then to the retailer, then to the final consumer. And if we assume that there is a input value and there should be some value addition which may value there is some value addition where there are some processing cost there are some profit and if we add the value addition with the value of input we should have value of output and if we think of we just have uh, we have told you the input vat so in its in each stage there is there is an input and in each stage there is an output so in both sides there should have some vat implication so you see if there is a vat if we put a column here vat paid on input and another column vat collected to be collected or vat uh, another word is vat levied or imposed on output and total invoice price including vat you see uh, on the, in the invoice there is a the, in the invoice you are com you commonly see that price and price including vat you see this kind of writing price including vat or in the invoice you see that the price has been written and the vat amount has been separated separately written and you see the final price here yes, what does it mean it is the output price and it is the vat price and what is it it is the invoice price okay so and there should be some difference between the input vat and the output vat which is to be paid by the respective party let me give you the name of that column vat paid so if we take an example that the good which has been uh, the raw material in fact which has been imported by the importer cost 100 taka and importer has incurred some processing cost which is say 10 taka and he has added some profit with that imported raw material in that case how much value addition has been done in total 30 yes sir 30 okay if we add the 30 with the input value how much should be the value of output One thirty. so if importer is supposed to pay that 15 percent on which price that he will pay that when he import imports his raw material this one or this one so 100 huh 100 on 100 
100 because it is his input his input is 100 taka so that input vat should be on 100 taka so it should be 15 and now if he goes for selling the this output to the producer at which price he will sell this 130 or he will have to collect the 15 percent vat So is it on 130? It should be on 130. So what he will do, he will add 15% on 130. Then he will sell the good to the producer. So how much is 15% on uh, 130? It is 19.5. Yes, sir. Okay. So what will be the invoice price to the producer when he will buy the goods from importer? When producer buys the goods from importer, what will be the invoice price he is supposed to pay to the importer? 149.50. 149.50. Okay. So let me write a column here. invoice and here that date or payable okay 149.5 okay now importer importer has already paid 15 and he has collected how much 19.5 is it yes and i can the importer uh, keep the additional 4.5 with him no sir the additional 4.50 has to be paid to the government okay in that case how much importer has paid in total 15 when he has bought the input and 4.5 how much is total 19.5 have we got it okay assuming that you have got it let's continue So the importer is supposed to clear this amount of head, 19.5. Now producer has got the goods from the importer. The goods, what he has got from the importer, that good has the input value of 149.5 or 130. Which one? 149.5 why it, it has it 19.5 uh, has no business uh, i mean 19.5 has no consequence on the producer's input value it is kind oh. of that he uh, has paid in addition oh, in addition okay, to so the input value okay. okay so then it will be 130 so it should be 130 Obviously, his invoice price was 149.5. So I'll show you later what he will do to clear or to collect the VAT what he has paid. Producer has paid how much VAT to the importer? Producer has paid how much VAT to the importer? When he was buying the 130 amount of good, 19.5 yes sir. 19.5 okay let's assume that producer has added this amount of value 35 for processing and 15 for profit 
In that case, what will be his output value? 180. 180. Now, how much VAT he paid to the importer? 19.5. 19.5. Okay. So when producer will sell the 180 worth of output to the wholesaler, what should be the invoice price and what should be the VAT he will impose on the output value? 15% rate? Invoice, invoice price will be 199.50. 199.50 how it is the vat what he has paid already to the producer yes, and sir. when producer will sell the good to the wholesaler producer will impose vat this amount or 15 percent on the output value so 15% of the output value, which, which is 27. So it should be 15% of the output value. Okay. Don't forget here. It it was also based on what? 100 or 130. This one. This one is based on 130 or 100. Yes, sir. 130, 130. This one is output value. Yes, sir. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so it should be 27. Now, what will be the invoice price? It will be 199.5 or 207. 207. Anyone missing here? How we are proceeding here? Anyone missing? No, sir. Okay, thank you. So now tell me how much VAT producer is now responsible to deposit to the government exchequer or the National Board of Revenue VAT Authority? How much, for how much amount producer is responsible? So 22.50. 22.50. How you have got it 22.5? Sir, first of all, the VAT rate is 15, then uh, 27 minus 19.5 huh. equals to 22.5. You see, Envier has already got this 15? Yes, sir. So, importer? Yes, sir. So, should Envier get double? No, sir, no. Then it will be 7.5. Have we got it? What I have yes, pointed sir. out? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Envier should get? 7.5. 7.5. How we have got 7.5? 27 minus 19.5 then we we'll minus 19.5 yes sir okay so if we uh, continue writing this uh, let me open it for you uh, from the text so that i will not write i feel that you have got the process right yes sir how we are proceeding? Okay. Sir, I have a question. Yes. Sir, Pratham Bari NDR Kapata Ka Bhaddaya Hoi Sir. Sorry? 15. Sir, Jokhon 100 Taka in value of input chilo, Tokhon NDR Kapata Ka Bhaddaya Hoi Sir. Producer Kapata Ka Bhaddaya Jama Kho Sir. When the input value was 100 Taka, Yes, sir. It is with the importer, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So if importer is supposed to pay VAT on the imported goods, how much VAT importer has paid to the NVR? 15? Yes, sir. Okay.
Okay. Let's continue. Uh, so the goods are now in the hand of wholesaler. Wholesaler has got the output value of how much? 180. And the processing cost and the profit 20, the total value addition is 25. So in that case, what is the output value in the stage of wholesaler? 205. And how much VAT wholesaler paid to the producer when he was buying the goods from producer? This one, 27. Here is the 27. And when wholesaler is selling the good to the retailer, how much VAT he will impose 15% on which value? 205 or 180? On 205. 205. So on 205, he has collected how much? 27. He paid how much? Uh, sorry. He collected 30.75 and he paid 27 to the producer in earlier stage. In that case, how much is now he responsible to pay to the NVR? This one, 3.75. Okay. Now, it happens in the similar way to the retailer. And when the goods in the is in the hand of final consumer, what is the value of the good to the final consumer? 225. But can you tell me how much consumer has to pay? Is it 225 or more than this or less than this? So more than this. By how much? He has to bear all this VAT. Yes, sir. Consumer has to bear all of this burden. That's why yes, VAT sir. is an indirect tax, right? Yes, sir. Sir, should so, that roll amount be uh, two hundred fifty-eight point seven five taka? It should be two twenty-five plus the all this amount, summation of all these figures. Okay. So how yes, much sir. you get? How much you are getting? Two fifty-eight point. 75. 75. Now, can you add, can you check that how much is 33.75 of the 225? So it is 15%. It is 15%. So in this way, this mechanism should work. This mechanism works only when the rates is constant, 15%, you see? The rate is constant 15% we have applied or we have changed the rate in different stage. No, no sir. sir, we have 15%. We have kept the rate 15% constant. Yes, sir. But the thing is that in Bangladesh, you will see that the rate varies from a stage to a stage. In that case, if the rate varies from a stage to a stage, Will it be possible to collect the amount what has been paid, for example, say a producer has to pay 15%, wholesaler, uh, say, uh, producer has to pay, say, 10%, retailer has to pay 5%. Will it be possible for the producer to recover the amount of VAT he has paid? No, sir. That is the difficulty what is happening in Bangladesh. And it is the problem in the case of uh, variable VAT rate. Okay. So before going for further discussion, let me familiarize with you another concept because we just have got the idea that in each stage, each party uh, can get the refund 
or can get the claim or claim the amount what he has paid in the name of input vat have you got the idea producer wholesaler yes, retailer when they are selling their output they are collecting output vat and it has been possible for them producer wholesaler retailer uh, importer it has been possible for them to get the refund rebate trans uh, get the claim of the input vat from the output vat has yes, it been sir. possible yes sir it okay. has been possible okay now the thing is that uh it is only possible when the vat rate is constant one thing is that and another thing is that when the goods are not vat exempt goods this mechanism works when the vat rate is 15% or vat rate is constant in all stages and it is not the goods are not vat exempt goods so the vat exempt goods are those goods which have been made exempt from the vat or value added tax by the declaration of the nbr or by the ruling of nbr so can we uh, can you give me an example which on which uh, the nbr has exempt vat recently very recently nbr has exempt some goods uh, some vat on some goods on which vat was applicable earlier covid-19 vaccine and all other vaccines and all other medical equipments which are uh, connected or which are very associated with the covid-19 treatment those goods have been exempt from the vat okay so what you will try to do you will look at the newspaper or you will find for this news and you will share about this with me in next class okay so in relation to this what is the opposite uh there are some goods which are known as zero rated goods zero rated so what does it mean it means that uh there are some goods which are on which vat is applicable but those goods are not vat exempt if vat is applicable can those goods can be vat exempt no sir those goods cannot be vat exempt on those goods vat is applicable but tax authority has declared that vat should be 0% on those goods some specific goods now if the question is how the vat exempt goods and the zero rated goods one type of good is vat exempt goods and the type of good is zero rated goods so we may feel that zero rated goods are 
look like vat exam goods because vat is not applicable but the thing is not like that in case of vat exam goods if there has been any input tax if there has been any input tax by mean of any form and we are will not give you the privilege to collect those amount what you have paid in the name of input tax by charging output tax you cannot do that in which case that exempt goods but in case of zero rated goods if you have paid any input tax you are permitted to get the refund of the amount what you paid in the transaction when you are making the purchase of input so that is how zero rated goods and vat exam goods are different so there has been a separate list it is an international practice that the some goods are zero rated goods for example uh, if i like to give you a global example uh, in the train or car the separate seats are installed for the kids and baby so those seats uh, which are for kids or which are for baby's purpose those product have been made zero rated that means vat is applicable but the rate is 0% but those are not vat exempt goods okay so we will have more examples in coming days regarding this type of goods so let's talk about we have got the mechanism that how uh, the responsibility of paying vat is transferred from one party to another party and we have realized that this process sometimes does not work smoothly as has been shown here when the vat rate is not uniform so in the income tax authorities you probably have seen there has been a uh, layers of authorities which uh, from the junior position or the starting position it starts from come kind of assistant revenue officer then revenue officer then assistant commissioner of taxes you probably have seen this kind of which uh, on the highest stage of the authority there has been the member of the nbr but after the member there are different chief commissioner of taxes in each zone there is uh, one commissioner responsible so in the vat uh, or value added tax there is separate authority uh, nbr has a uh, broadly three wing Uh, one is for income tax another one is for uh, value added tax then another one is for uh, custom duty so uh, i can't recall right now where it has been uh, displayed uh, in their website but nbr has broadly uh three wing uh, in addition to this thing there has been another wing uh so three core wings are 
income tax, value added tax, and the customs duty. So in each wing, the authorities are similar, which starts from a uh, very junior assistant revenue officer and which uh, range from assistant revenue officer to chief commissioner. So what I like to show you right now, that is when you will feel that you need registration under the value added tax and supplementary duty act 2012. So let me open the pay, uh, act from the original source. It is not here. If you like to see the act from here, what can you do? You can open this. Is it probably open? No. Okay. So it is in Bangla. English is also available. So the question is when you have to take the registration under this act. This question is similar to the question when you are supposed to submit the income tax return. Can you recall? There are some conditions. Okay, does this wordings uh, look very easier to understand to you? The 47. These wordings are very easy going to you. What does it no, mean? Sir. Okay, not easy going. So in that case, let me uh, give you the wordings in the English. The thing is that uh, we are now dealing with the issue that when you have to take the registration under this uh, value added tax and supplementary duty act 2012. So the answer is it is based on the turnover. So what is turnover? We already have clear date in previous classes. So if from your economic activities, so there is a clear concept of economic activities in this uh, act, let me show you here. If your economic activities give you the turnover, uh, which is uh, from a threshold amount, you see, the economic activities, there is a clear definition of this. Okay. What you are doing, you are in the business of supplying goods, supplying service, supplying fixed kind of assets. Other than this, if you are engaged in any profession, any occupation, any uh, income generating activity where you are undertaking uh, for the purpose of producing goods or you are taking lease or you are providing, uh, you have taken license for what purpose? For supplying goods, services, or you have some commercial activities you transform. Uh, so this kind of economic activities, which is, uh, what should I say, it, it, kind of self-explanatory. If I ask you what is economic activity, this kind of a very uh, self-explanatory. But what is our question? Our question is when we should take the registration under this act. 
So the answer is that if you have the turnover from the activities, what I just have mentioned, uh, that is the, if you have the annual turnover, what is the range of the time? 12 months, right? In the 12 months time, if you have the annual turnover, which is above this limit, and this limit is known as registration threshold. So what is this amount? 2.4 million or 24 million or 0.24 million? 2.4 million. 2.4 million. Taka? Yes, sir. So what does it mean? It means that, let me make it more clear. Uh, you will get the reference from your text if you, uh, if your page number 482 is open before you. A person whose turnover exceeds the registration threshold within a 12 month period closing at the end of the month preceding that month. So when you are thinking of taking the registration uh, before uh, that month, if you look at the 12 month turnover and you see that your turnover has exceeded uh, 2.4 million taka, in that case, you are supposed to take the registration under this act. Another clause is that uh, a person whose estimated turnover exceeds the registration threshold within the succeeding 12 month period beginning at the start of the start of the preceding month. The thing is that if you feel that in expected 12 month time, coming 12 month time, uh, you will have turnover which will exceed this 2.4 million taka. In that case, you are also have, uh, supposed to take the registration under the VET and Supplementary Duty Act. Now, let me give you an example. Uh, uh, from the text, this example is available. Let's say the date today is July 15, 2019. And a company has prepared this financial statements, which ended on 30 June. 2019. The financial statement is prepared in which date? This date. Right now, the company is in which date? In this date. So, this date is preceding of this date or succeeding of this date? This date is preceding of this date, this date precedes. precedes this date or succeeds this date? So precedes the, the, that precedes uh, this date. This date contains a story of only this date or 12 months date. This date, the financial statements have been prepared on this date. The financial statements which has been prepared for this time this statement contains the story of 12 months or a single date. It has been prepared for the previous 12 months. I'm not asking for balance sheet. The turnover, turnover stays higher balance sheet or income statement? Income statement. So in that case, the income statement is prepared for a specific date or it is prepared for a range of date, a range of period, right? It is for the period and the period is for 12 months in general, okay? So the company has reported on this date that it had turnover of uh, 30.5 million. Now the question is, is this company 
supposed to take the registration? Under this act? Have we got the question? What is the threshold? 2.4 million. 2.4 million. This company has reported how much turnover? 30.5 million. So this company is clearly should take the registration because it is within the 12 months and it has uh, surplus the 24 2.4 million okay now some companies are it is based on uh, some kind of turnover okay but some companies are supposed to take the registration uh, based on uh, what should i say the mandatory registration uh, let me check whether it is available here when mandatory registration is applicable for you uh, okay Okay, uh, before going for mandatory registration, uh, let me check some exception. Uh, exception for turnover. I mean, in the calculation of turnover, which values will not be included? You see? You cannot include this in the calculation of turnover. And there has, is some additional rule, which is uh, I can't find out this exactly from uh, that act, but it is all obviously available here. I'm referring from your text, page number uh, 483, where it has been said the mandatory registration is applicable. Mandatory. So when mandatory registration is applicable, if anyone is in a business where he or she supplies or manufactures any goods or service, which is subject to supplementary duty in Bangladesh. So if you are in a business on which supplementary duty is applicable, you must take the registration under this act. Have you heard about the supplementary duty? Have you heard about yes, supplementary duty? Heard huh? You have heard about it. Okay. We'll talk about it detail in next class, which is basically uh, imposed on the luxury type of goods so you are familiar with the 300 uh, percent tax on the car imported in our country yes sir so that duty is, uh, is a part of supplementary duty okay so if i ask you that uh say if there is a company who sells auto that company should take mandatory registration under this act let me uh, skip the term company for example you are a businessman you sell auto imported reconditioned auto on which what is applicable? Supplementary duty is applicable. In that case, should you take the mandatory registration? Is it mandatory for you? 
Are you getting the question? I'm giving you the answer, then I'm asking question, then I'm asking. The answer is already available to you. As the businessman is involved in se selling or supplying some goods on which SD is applicable, that's why mandatory registration is applicable for him. Okay. Now, have you heard about uh, this company? Yes, sir. What is its business? Sir, uh, it quite do you think about Shraga, sir? Uh, taxi number, sir. Sorry, there. So, my taxi must probably the other at the section, sir. Uh, hmm. Construction basically, uh, construction site is uh, like okay. How they get the construction work by participating in some contract or by participating in some tender? Uh, yes, sir, by participating. Uh, by if you are someone who does contract to get this kind of work or who participate in tender, you must have the mandatory registration under this act. Have we got the clause? Uh, yes, sir. Now, yes, sir. For example, you are someone. Uh, who export crocodile from Bangladesh? Is the spelling correct? So maybe it's correct. <laughs> maybe it's correct. Yes, maybe sir. it's from my side. I'm getting confirmed from you. So maybe it's not available in your hand. Maybe. I have said maybe it is correct or may not uh, be sir, correct. Uh, it's perfect. It's perfect. Okay, fine. So you are someone who exports crocodile from Bangladesh. Do you know Bangladesh is one of the countries which export crocodile? Sir, I guess I'm not. Okay. So uh, you read newspaper? You read uh, newspaper, sometimes. daily newspaper, sometimes. Newspaper is not sometimes published. Newspaper is daily published. Published, newspaper is published daily. So we are supposed to read the newspaper daily. So what I'm requesting you to uh, read the today's newspaper and you will see that someone who pioneered in the export of crocodile from Bangladesh uh, was died in the prison uh, day before yesterday. Right? Yes, sir. Okay, that person was the pioneer in exporting crocodile from Bangladesh. So what I'm trying to say, if you're a person who export or, or import in Bangladesh, he has to take the mandatory registration. Have we got it? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, there are some specific geographical area in Bangladesh where if you do set up a business, you have to take the mandatory registration. So what is your expectation? In which area this uh, geographical region lies will it be in a very remote place or it should be in a very important places areas in the capital city or metropolitan city if you do set up a business here you have to take the mandatory registration so is it an important areas so metropolitan area it should be some important areas, including EPZ, including capital city, okay? So I'm not giving you such uh, example, I'm just giving you the idea. So in addition to that, uh, there has been a general order that will be available here. If you want to see here, uh, you see the geo, 
you see yes sir okay if you go to the vet go vet general order you will see several uh several general orders which have been issued earlier and you will see one general order where it has been mentioned that if you are if these conditions are applicable for you you are supposed to take the mandatory registration okay for example let me give you an example uh what should i say you see this one the general idea is that the participants who will will participate in the international trade fair they will have to pay the value added tax okay so what i am trying to say that uh, you will see some general orders where it has been said that you are supposed to take the mandatory registration so i need to find out that uh, you will see the reference from your text uh, when you have to take the registration as a obligation okay otherwise you will be penalized by the authority okay let's continue when we are talking about registration which registration is mentioned which registration is our interest is it the tax identification number it is not the tax identification number let me give you the idea it is the bin number can anyone speculate what should be the b b business identification number business okay. identification number okay thank you very much okay so from where you will get it if you go to the home page you see the e bin yes okay. yes sir so what can you do also here online vet registration okay for vet registration what you will do you will go here and file for vet registration and other than this uh, let me tell you that how many registration is necessary for you for example i am giving an example from the text okay let me explain this example okay uh, abc company owns two factories you see two factories one is factory 1 and the one is factory 2 uh, but they has a single central depot factory 1 factory 2 central depot from this central depot they transfer their goods to regional depot this is how a typical business operates okay it is for the production side it is for the supply side now okay delivery side so how many regional depot they have three Yes. under this three regional depot how many sales depot they have six sales six depot. now the question is a uh, factory one manufactures mobile phones and laptops of different models and price you see mobile phone and laptop and factory two also produce the same kind of good or similar goods you see 
Yes, sir. Okay. So it has been mentioned that the products manufactured by the two factories are first transferred to the central depot, which are then stored in the regional depot. These are stored in the different regional depot. Finally, these products are sold to the distributors via the sales depot. So the company also imports similar goods, which are then sold via the same channel, the, from factory to central, central to regional, regional to sales, sales to uh, distributor. So it has been mentioned that they are all books of accounts are recorded or maintained centrally. All books and accounts and records are maintained centrally. So if I ask you that what kind of registration is more suitable for them, they should take the registration for uh, factory one separately, factory two separately, and uh, for the or they should take a single registration. Which one will be more uh, favorable for them? If they, if they take the single registration. So it has been said that if any person conducts it, economic activities by supplying identical or similar goods and services from two or more places. So they are, we have observed that there have been uh, several places but what they do they preserve all books and records centrally in that case what they can do they can take central registration instead of taking the unit registration have you got it so it will be based on the how they want to take the registration but there is another alternative. If you see that this company, this company look different or same? This company look different. How? So before that, uh, in the previous, for the previous company, it, it, it just had a central registration, but this in, in this, this company, this company had a unit registration. So in that case, what will be a suggestion for this company? This company will have to take the take central registration, sir. Central or decentral. It has to take the so unit the, registration. Uh, unit it has to take the unit registration for what reason because the factories uh, though they record or maintain their books centrally they do not have the similar products in different factories right yes, their sir. products are different their products are different so nvr has also mentioned that if any manufacturer produces and supplies identical or similar goods from two or more places and maintains all records and ac accounts of economic activity in a central unit, in that case, you have to take the central or single registration. Okay, so there are some other exceptions. For example, if an, any entity manufactures identical or similar goods and supplies the same 15 percent is uh, also applicable through its own sales depot or warehouse they can also obtain the central registration if their vat rate is uniform or applicable vat rate is uniform so you will see some other exceptions from your text. What I like to highlight right now, if you want to go here, fire. 
online VAT registration. What you need to do? If we go for sign up, we have to make an account here first. But the thing is that after having the sign up, you will see uh, there has been a good amount of learning uh, regarding VAT in a separate portal. It has it has been separate portal under this uh, nbr.gov.bd is a separate site. But the thing is that in general, if you want to take the registration under this act, you need to have some document available with you. Can anyone tell me if you want to set up a business by yourself, which document you first need to take at the very beginning? Trade license. Very good. Shared license. So similarly, it has to be submitted when you want to take the VAT registration. Okay. Now, so if your business is a kind of partnership, which is very typical nowadays, what you, we need to submit? Deed. Yes, sir. Okay. And the owner's team certificate. Then there are some other certificate. Uh, what you have to add, uh, which is also kind of your eating number kind of your uh, NID number, NID, then you have to submit your photograph, then you have to submit your bank solvency certificate, these things, okay? So we have come to learn where the teen is required. Can anyone mention one example, what you can remember right now, where teen number is required? Sir, in case of uh, admitting the children into English medium schools, the teen number is required. Okay. You have remembered it very well. I probably have mentioned it in class, right? Yes, sir. Okay, okay. So now the question is, where the bean will be required? If you want to make import or export, Except the baggage import. Uh, in that case, the bin is required. Can anyone uh, do? You, uh, anyone uh, does anyone have the idea that what is baggage import? Some of our students from uh, sir, from... illegal no, 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 no. Uh, most interestingly, some of our students, probably from 25th, have opened a new business to uh, sell cosmetics products which will be directly imported from UK. Yes, sir. Is there any person here? Yes, sir. Here I am, sir. I'm one of the partners of the business. <laughs> okay. Does your import look like baggage import? Uh, sir, uh, yes. Uh, How you import? Sir, uh, I'm not an active partner, but from... Uh, You're from sleeping. I'm... Yes, sleeping sleeping partner. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm a sleeping partner. <laughs> okay. Okay. But uh, uh, can you tell me how you source the product? Sir, uh, sir, sir, I am a partner. 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 I that means there are uh, again different channel. The channel is not direct. Uh, sir, I'm not sure, but sir, I think the, the channel is direct. 
Okay, okay. Uh, so far, my knowledge goes the baggage import looks like uh, some people uh, do business by traveling to foreign country and buy goods from there and come to our country and sell goods here. Okay. Yes, sir. So those uh, are kind of import for which bean is not necessary. Have you got it? But I need to check it that what has been clearly mentioned by the baggage import in the law, uh, there should be a very clear definition. Then if you want to have a land for your business in that case you need to uh, take the registration for of the land are you familiar with this you have to take the registration of land in that case you have to show your bean number now have you heard about this authority uh, controller of import and export Have you heard about this authority? Many of you nowadays are interested to set up your own business yourselves. So you will have a very uh, specific course to chain up on this. Uh, that course will be available to you in the next year, the entrepreneurship. So as an entrepreneur or as a businessman, we need to have an idea that which documents, which registration, which procedures are required to set up a business here. So these are kind of some learning other than the tax learning we need to have, okay? Uh, so one uh, certificate that is known as import registration certificate or export registration certificate. So when you will go for VAT registration, you have to submit the import registration certificate or export registration certificate. So from where it is available, controller of import and export. Controller of import and export. Okay, from where, uh, there it is available. Let me take you to the site of the controller of import and export. In Bangladesh, this one. Office of the Chief Com uh, Controller of Import and Export. Have you heard about it? This, uh, this office name. You probably have heard about this name in Bangla. In yes, Bangla, sir. Your education, right? Yes, sir. Okay. So this site is useful if you want to participate in the import and export because you have to take the license from here uh, for import and export. Okay. So these are the certificate uh, information you need to know before applying for the certificate, okay? So other than having the, the without having the permission from the this controller, uh, none can participate in the import and export. That import and export will become illegal import and illegal export, okay? Okay, so what we are doing, we are trying to learn higher the bean number will be useful. So, we just have made an example of Toma construction. What Toma construction was doing, they was participating, that they were participating in some tender and getting some construction works. So if you want to participate in tender, you need to have this. Okay, which number? Business identification number. number. Okay. Now if if you want to take the bank loan for your business, you need to have the BIN number, okay? 
So these are some examples where the bin number will be useful. And is there any person uh, who has submitted his income tax return in my class voluntarily by for the sake of interest? Have you got my question? Any person yes, who has submitted income tax return just to test or just to check that how it works? Okay, the thing is that uh, there is another registration available that is known as voluntary VAT registration. Okay, so the name implies that when it is applicable, it is not in fact applicable. If you want to volunteer to take registration by yourself, you may apply for it. But the thing is that once you obtain the voluntary VAT registration, you have to continue the registration at least for one year. You cannot discontinue your registration within one year, okay? So that is all about for today's session. Uh, let me stop the recording first.